Missouri School of Journalism. Welcome to Global Journalists. I'm Jason McClure. Juul and other e-cigarette makers are facing new limits on the sale of their products in the U.S. after reports that at least 16 people have died and more than 800 sickened by lung ailments linked to vaping. But internationally, e-cigarette makers are looking to grow. According to the market research firm Euromonitor, the number of people in the world who vape will increase by a third to 55 million between 2018 and 2021. And as companies like Juul look to grow outside the United States, they face a huge range in the way that regulators and the public view e-cigarettes. In some countries like France, vaping is encouraged as one of the best ways to get people to stop smoking cigarettes. In other places like Thailand, vaping sales are banned as a health menace, and people can even be fined for possessing an e-cigarette. So on this edition of Global Journalist, a look at how e-cigarettes are viewed around the world and how the outbreak of vaping-related lung illnesses in the U.S. might affect what's already a $20 billion a year industry. So to kick things off, we're going to hear about two countries that have taken radically different approaches to e-cigarettes. Up first is the United Kingdom, and for that we're pleased to be joined by Linda Bald. She's a professor of public health at the University of Edinburgh. She joins us now from Scotland. Linda, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the program. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, as I mentioned, the way that e-cigarettes are treated in the UK, it's quite different than they are in the US. Give us just a little bit of an overview. Yeah, so we have quite uh, firm regulations that have been placed since 2016 that are quite different from the US. They are largely come from Europe. So the key components of those are we limit the nicotine content in the devices to 20 milligrams per milliliter. All the devices have to carry a nicotine health warning. Um, the e-liquid containers are limited to 10 milliliters. Um, they have to have child and tamper-proof packaging. And we've banned almost all forms of e-cigarette marketing. And well, finally, we have a, a notification system, which means the products have to be registered with a, a national agency. And if I could just back you up for a moment, you, you said that there was some limits on the nicotine content. I think you said it was 20 milligrams, uh, milligrams per package and uh, the volume could only be 10 milliliters, if I got that correctly. How, how is that different than the United States? So um, in terms of the nicotine content, some of the devices in the U.S. have uh, almost three times as much nicotine in them. Um, and also you have more variable refill container sizes and also tank sizes on your products. So those are important differences. And there's a bit of a debate about our level. Um, it might not be high enough, for example, to help uh, heavily um, dependent smokers quit. But on the other side, because it's lower, the products might be less addictive. And in the U.S., the Food and Drug Associ uh, Agency, it hasn't approved e-cigarettes as, as uh, an aid to quit smoking. They're not supposed to be marketed in this way. In the U.K., it's a bit different. That's true. We have two routes to regulation. So just to be clear, we don't actually have any products that have been licensed as medicines in the U.K. One product does was given a license but hasn't come onto prescription. And actually, it's not really an e-cigarette. It's more like an inhalator. So... Actually, all of our products are consumer products here. They're also not allowed to make any health claims. But in contrast, our public health agencies are able to communicate with smokers about vaping being an option for them. So though the companies can't market health claims, we have managed to try and communicate the fact that these products are less harmful than smoking. So that, that, is, that is a bit different than in the U.S. Now, since these deaths in the United States and the reporting on the more than 800 people who have been sickened uh, after vaping. We've seen a number of states take steps to block their sale. Massachusetts has announced that it's banning vaping products. Um, other places, including um, a number of different states, but the Trump administration as well have moved to ban flavored, these like watermelon or mint flavored uh, capsules that people use to vape. How does that compare with the reaction in the UK? So the first thing to emphasize is we haven't seen this public health outbreak, the very serious and very worrying cases of serious respiratory illness and also deaths that you've seen in the US. We've not seen uh, those cases and we know that because our notification system requires or um, provides a yellow card system where health professionals and others can list adverse events. Not to say we haven't had any, but we're not seeing this outbreak. Um, 
So we um, are not planning in the UK, our, our government or our key agencies, to ban the products. We have no plans to do that. Um, we're not planning to um, impose a flavor ban. We're watching, obviously, with interest what is going on in the US. But we've had these products, as indeed you have, for almost a decade. And the data we're seeing over here is actually they are very helpful for helping smokers to quit smoking. So that's um, important that we don't lose that opportunity here. And we should point out that many of the people who have been sickened uh, by e-cigarettes report that they actually used the devices to smoke or to vape uh, THC, the psychoactive ingredient in, in cannabis, in marijuana, or that they had cut the, the, the nicotine vials with some other chemicals as a way to sort of extend how much they could vape. Yeah, I think what you're seeing, and certainly there's a new article um, of lung biopsy published today in the New England Journal of Medicine that I found very helpful. You're seeing um, uh, contaminated products. So because our uh, market is, is really more tightly regulated in Europe and the UK, um, I'm not saying that we don't have illicit products, but that may be one explanation why we haven't seen them. I think the cannabis angle also complicates issues. So obviously you have some states that have legalized cannabis. is not uncommon, including in your youth, to vape cannabis, it's much more less common here. Uh, THC um, products are not legal in the UK, and uh, it's it, certainly in our surveys, we're not picking up that people are vaping cannabis in large numbers. So that's probably another explanation as to why you're seeing um, these cases, unfortunately. And I'm glad you raised the issue of youth use of this, because in addition to sort of concerns about public health generally, in the U.S., I think it's a lot of people are very concerned about this huge spike in the number of teenagers who are using these products. There was a survey out this year that showed more than a quarter, 27.5 percent of high school students, so that's like 15 to 18, reported using an e-cigarette in 2019. How does it look in the U.K.? Is it a similar problem? So I mean, we've been tracking youth use very carefully. We have several surveys that are uh, annual and some, in fact, more frequent than that. And we are not seeing the same pattern. So up until 2016, the US and UK youth use figures looked pretty similar. There was a lot of experimentation, not much regular use, um, except in smoke, kids who already smoked. Your youth rates are now significantly higher. Um, so just to give you a flavor, in some of our surveys, we do see that you know, 20% of young people have tried them. But when you look at regular use, particular use at least once a week, the numbers are much lower. They're almost entirely in kids who already smoke and um, for whom actually e-cigarettes probably are a safer option. But amongst teenagers who've never smoked in the UK, the rates of regular use are less than half a percent. Um, we can discuss why that might be the case, but we certainly are seeing a different path. Yeah, sorry, I mean, we, our time grows short, but if you could just quickly tell us why that might be, why is this so much more popular among American teenagers than among British teenagers? So number one reason, marketing. Uh, in the US, you permit almost all forms of marketing, and even despite recent federal government crackdowns, crackdowns that's not been tackled. Uh, second thing, probably the higher nicotine content is a factor, particularly with the new devices like Juul. And finally, our public health agencies promote these products to smokers, and the imagery that's used is men with beards in midlife who are struggling to quit, who turn to a vaping device and find it helpful. So the appeal, I think, is quite different here, and that might explain some of the differences as well. Well, Linda Bald, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Not at all. Thank you. A reminder that you're tuned into Global Journalist. We're talking today about how countries around the world address the issue of vaping in the wake of 16 deaths linked to e-cigarette use in the U.S. and a recent government survey that found more than a quarter of U.S. high school students vape. We heard about how vaping is treated in the United Kingdom. Up next is a country with a very different approach. Last month, India's government moved forward with a law that would ban the sale, manufacture, and advertising of all e-cigarettes. So for more on this, we're going to bring in Samrat Chowdhury. He's the director of the Association of Vapors of India. This is a pro-e-cigarette advocacy group. Samrat, welcome. Hello, Jason. Thank you for having me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. I mean, I guess if you could start out, uh, India has more than 100 million smokers, I understand. But the way people smoke in India is a bit different than in the U.S. Cigarette brands like Marlboro and Newport, they're just they're not as popular or common there. Tell us a bit about that. Well, uh, India has a wide spectrum of tobacco use and smoking is a part of that. In fact, uh, more people use smokeless tobacco 
than smoke in the country by a factor of two to one. In smoking, also cigarettes form a small percentage of overall smoking, about 11 percent, and a majority of the 110 million smokers smoke uh, something called bidi, which is uh, tobacco rolled in a in a in a leaf. It's a tendu leaf without filter, and it's smoked, and it's uh, uh, delivers a lot more nicotine in much more harmful way. Okay, so uh, so these beaties, these hand rolled cigarettes that are the way that most Indians smoke, it sounds like the health effects of these are are even greater than um, typical manufactured cigarettes potentially. Certainly, and that is why you have about a million people uh, dying from uh, tobacco and smoking related illnesses every year. Well, talk to us about how people, how common is it that people in India used e-cigarettes? Obviously, the government is moving forward with a ban. Um, those who do, I guess, will be violating, if they purchase them in India, they'll be violating the law. I mean, is this a, is this a popular, is this a popular habit? Well, not, not so popular yet. The uh, reason for that is right uh, from 2014, the government has been acting or, or has taken a dim view of e-cigarettes. Uh, to the effect that there hasn't been a lot of industry activity and the products have not been uh, widely available. Most of it is imported. Uh, while e-liquids are made in the country, the devices mostly are imported from China. And that is one of the reasons why it hasn't taken off, despite there being a reasonable amount of awareness, at least among cigarette smokers, about the harms of smoking. And uh, there are smokers who are looking to quit but don't have enough options. Well, the government has said that it wants to prevent an epidemic of youth vaping, which is exactly what we have in the United States. I mean, isn't isn't that a good thing? Research shows that nicotine damages brain development for, for young people. Uh, while all, all steps should be taken to prevent teen use, in India you also have to see it in the economic uh, 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 perspective. Cigarettes are sold loose in the country, which means every kid uh, can afford it or can buy or access a cigarette. And uh, that is how most people started smoking because uh, cigarettes were widely available and uh, those who could not afford cigarettes could smoke weedies, which are even much, much cheaper and are hardly taxed. So, so nicotine in the form of smoking, the most dangerous way to consume nicotine is available widely. Uh, E-cigarettes, on the other hand, are at least 10 times more expensive and not that easily accessible uh, to teens. So the problem would be a lot different. And, and uh, just taking the U.S. fears and transposing them in India may not be a wise idea. Well, I mean, this, this promotion of e-cigarettes as a smoking cessation tool, I mean, how feasible is that in India, given that, you know, much of the population lives on less than five dollars a day? In the U.S., at least, a jewel costs fifty dollars. So it doesn't it seems like this would be even just a limited a limited number of people who would be accessing e-cigarettes. Well, not really. If the government did look into it and did consider this seriously, uh, uh, the technology is not high end. It, you know, the vape pens at the low end can be made cheap. India is the largest, among the largest producers of liquid nicotine. So uh, the products could be made available at cheaper rates. And it could be a solution also for BD smokers. In fact, we have done a project with BD smokers and tried to see whether these products could work for them and, uh, and would be affordable. And on both counts, they do work. But it requires a regulatory push and some incentivizing on part of the government. Well, we heard, uh, we heard Linda Bald earlier talking about why she thought that teen use of e-cigarettes was so much lower in the United Kingdom than it was uh, in the United States. And the first thing that she mentioned was marketing and advertising. How, how, what's your view on that? How, what does that look like in India? Uh, we would support uh, uh, measures that U UK has taken, including capping the nicotine strength initially, which is not to say uh, not make uh, higher nicotine strength uh, liquids available, because for certain he uh, heavy smokers, that may be the only thing that works. But there could be tighter controls on higher nicotine uh, 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 you know, products and mandatory age verification or some sort of uh, medicalization if that is appropriate. Well, I wanted to ask you as well, um, and our time is, is, is running short here, but I want to ask you about sort of the, the issues many people have with this harm reduction argument that you and others make. These are identical arguments that Philip Morris and Altria and these big tobacco companies who are now big players 
in the e-cigarette market have made before in favor of cigarettes 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And these arguments uh, ultimately weren't scientifically valid and and the way that cigarettes were marketed by these companies ultimately killed millions and millions and millions of people so i mean against that backdrop can you see why people are skeptical of these arguments well i certainly understand the skepticism but that was also 20 30 years ago we live in a different world where science is 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 almost unanimous in saying that there is significant harm reduction with these devices because the main harm comes from combustion and uh, e-cigarettes don't uh, burn anything. So we would we would uh, obviously welcome an evidence-led approach. But what we are seeing at the moment is a lot of uh, paranoia and uh, uh, irrational fear towards it, and and also a lot of uh, 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 moralizing that we want to uh, eliminate tobacco use. Uh, but we are what we are talking about is a pragmatic way of reducing harm from tobacco because we have a lot of people dying. There's a huge economic loss to the country every year. And we need to look at solutions which can work now and not not many decades from uh, now when many millions would die. Well, Samra Chowdhury, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you. On today's program, we're talking about the wide discrepancy in the way different countries address e-cigarette use around the world. A quick reminder that you can always find us online at globaljournalist.org. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. You can get our podcast on Spotify, iTunes, or NPR Podcasts. Now, to get a wider view of this issue, we're going to bring in two other guests. Joining us from Baltimore is Ryan David Kennedy. He's a tobacco control researcher at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Ryan, welcome. Thank you, Jason. And also joining us from London is Ivan uh, Genov. He's a senior analyst who covers the tobacco and vaping industry for the market research firm Euromonitor. Ivan, welcome. Good morning, and thank you for the invite once again. Well, Ryan, let's start with you. Uh, we talked earlier to experts in India and the UK about the very, very different ways e-cigarettes are regulated there. Give us just sort of briefly like an overview of, of how they're regulated everywhere else. Sure. So uh, we at the Institute for Global Tobacco Control here at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, we conduct a global policy scan of e-cigarette regulations. So we've been actively trying to conduct surveillance to understand how different countries around the world are approaching regulations for these emerging devices. So e-cigarettes um, have been around for around 10 years. We have been um, actively reaching out to countries for several years now in our, our scan. Uh, we've identified almost 100 countries, I think we're at 98 countries right now, that have some form of regulation at a federal level to um, oversee many different aspects of these products. So we, when we look at regulations, we're looking at things like, um, do you have to be a minimum age to purchase and use these devices? Um, are there restrictions on marketing and communications? Are there packaging or safety requirements required? Of course, the e-liquid bottles, there's safety dimensions around spillage or poisoning. Um, are there product regulations with respect to how the products are designed? Are there caps on nicotine concentration? Um, are there specific reporting and, or notification requirements to um, uh, manufacturers, for example, have to tell ministries of health about ingredients or constituents in the devices? Um, are these devices included in clean air regulations around, you might think of it as like smoke-free or aerosol-free um, policies? And of course, how are these devices being taxed? Um, within our scan, I think one of the things that's really interesting, when we started our scan, we identified many countries that were regulating e-cigarettes, but their uh, application of regulation was um, using existing laws that had been written that were not necessarily authored with e-cigarettes in mind. But by the nature of what e-cigarettes were, they're, um, if they included nicotine, for example, uh, then some of these products might have been classified as tobacco products and therefore fall under regulation of their tobacco acts. Okay, okay. Um, and this is this is actually uh, quite an important distinction. And we want to come back to this in a moment, but I want to, I want to bring in Ivan Genov too, because earlier in the program, you know, I mentioned that your firm has forecast very robust growth in the global market for e-cigarettes over the next few years. Where is that growth going to come from? 
have these deaths, these uh, this outbreak of illness in the United States linked to vaping, has that caused you to rethink those projections? Well, at the moment, we uh, we are sticking with our current uh, projections. There are uh, signs of um, stable growth within uh, a variety of markets within Eastern and Western Europe. Uh, there is also uh, stable growth in some Asian markets, particularly in Japan and South Korea, where heated tobacco is quite popular. Uh, and also, of course, the U.S., where e-vaping um, in, the, in the form of uh, pot systems is also very popular. Of course, um, the latest uh, news about vaping, uh, the vaping illnesses, the so-called vaping illness is uh, a concern that uh, will probably uh, play a role in our next review. Uh, but for the moment, we, we don't think this is an existential threat to, to e-vaping, uh, and uh, we forecast the growth to continue in the next five years. And, uh, and Ivan, you mentioned heated tobacco products. This is something that isn't familiar, I don't think, to many people in the U.S. This is something different from juuling, from vaping, where you're actually inhaling something that starts out as a liquid. And in fact, Philip Morris International has a popular product called Icos. Talk, talk to us about that, how that's different. <laughs> Yeah, so ICOS is, is at the center of uh, Philip Morris's transformation. Um, they're actually betting quite heavily uh, on this product. Um, it's uh, they claim is substantially safer than than combustible cigarettes, uh, and uh, it's actually um, the, the consumable element looks like a, a normal cigarette. It's slightly shorter, and then it's inserted in a device which heats the tobacco and then the vapor is inhaled. This is a product that accounts for uh, a big portion of the tobacco market in Japan, currently uh, around 20%. It is uh, showing stable growth in certain Central and Eastern European markets. Uh, and it's already in a testing phase in the US. Uh, so I think uh, Altria hopes to uh, commercialize it in the in the future and uh, ultimately to uh, to sell a lot of this product. So, uh, and, so and so we uh, should just point out that the key distinction here is that this is actually tobacco that's heated; it's not burned. Vaping exactly. is a liquid containing nicotine. But but if I could just turn this back to Ryan Kennedy, then. Uh, you know, in the U.S., many of the reported deaths and illnesses from vaping, you know, the people who have been affected reported that they vaped THC, the psychoactive ingredient in marijuana, or that they had, you know, basically cut the, the nicotine um, from, their, from their Juul or their other vaping product. How, how does this affect the debate around about vaping safety? In the U.S., it's interesting that e-cigarettes were deemed a tobacco product. They were then moved under the authority of the FDA for the Center for Tobacco Products with the Tobacco Control Act. Um, the devices, of course, can be used to administer a whole range of constituents, different types of drugs. Um, and, and so it's it's a really interesting regulatory approach where the this class of products um, is essentially considered a tobacco product, um, but the devices themselves um, could be used to, I mean, some e-cigarettes advertise that they administer vitamins, they administer melatonin. Um, we did research here at um, Hopkins to understand um, innovations around these devices to perhaps deliver constituents that could be associated with weight loss. Um, it's uh, They're a very flexible um, uh, device that um, could have benefit for other drug administration. But um, when we think of the devices in the context of the U.S., it's very much as a nicotine delivery system. And uh, Ivan, get off, if I could bring you back in, you know, it seems like there are a couple of big markets where there's potentially a lot of room for growth for these e-cigarette makers. China obviously has the, was the world's most populous country, has the, the most smokers of any country in the world. Also, Indonesia is a place where I think something like more than a, a third of adult men smoke. W what, does, what does this debate look like in those countries? Uh, so the debate in these countries uh, is, uh, in, I would say, it's influenced by uh, the debate in uh, in the U.S. and the EU. Um, Juul started selling in in China um, a couple of weeks ago, but after only uh, five or six days, it was taken down. So obviously the um, 
the developments in the US are playing a role there as well. The interesting part about China is that it's the biggest producer of devices in, in the world. Uh, the Shenzhen area is where a lot of the e-vapor uh, devices are, are being produced. And it's it's a big uh, market, more than 300 million smokers and around 3 million vapors at the moment. The government there has published a draft uh, national standard that specifies a range of uh, permitted uh, additives, illiquid purity, uh, concentration uh, limits, and so on. So this is this is taking shape right now. Uh, but at the moment, it's it's difficult to say if uh, a market like China will will embrace. Uh, potentially reduce risk products or not. Uh, the situation in uh, Indonesia is uh, quite similar. Uh, I think uh, vaping uh, vaping companies and also big tobacco companies uh, would like to see uh, their vaping portfolios uh, selling there as well. Uh, but the, the situation is quite turbulent at the moment, and it's hard to predict how the regulatory uh, scheme will develop in the future. Well, Ryan Kennedy, I mean, it strikes me that a lot of this debate in each country is shaped not exclusively by science, but around each country's cultural experience with smoking that many ways like like each each country's individual experience with the last hundred years of cigarette smoking uh, greatly affects how they view these arguments around e-cigarettes given that the major e-cigarette makers are controlled by these legacy tobacco companies there's a lot of things that play in terms of uh, regulations and approach you're right cultural um uh, dimensions are very relevant. I think you heard from the UK. Um, it's a jurisdiction that is very open to harm reduction approaches, for example, in terms of how they address uh, public health problems. Um, I think something else that's relevant in the context of public health and how we begin to think about regulation of these products is where a country might be not only in its tobacco epidemic, um, but where they're at in their evolution and development of tobacco control policies. Uh, Indonesia is a really interesting country. Like you said, it has very high smoking prevalence rates. It's not a signatory to the Global Treaty on Tobacco Control. Uh, they have a long way to go as a country in terms of implementing and adopting um, comprehensive um, smoke-free laws, for example, and other things that we think about, um, the, the different uh, interventions that are important to um, support people to not start smoking and if they've decided to quit, to stay quit. I, th I think another um, important dimension is uh, affordability, too. Um, some of the countries like Indonesia, a lot of the people who might use combustible tobacco products, the entry level for e-cigarettes still might be a little too, too high in terms of the price pointing. Um, and so I think we're going to see a lot of innovation and development on the product side um, if, the, if the market is to grow in some of these parts of the world. Well, uh, I'm sorry, we're just we're out of time for this edition of Global Journalist of Production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the Missouri School of Journalism, KBIA Mid-Missouri Public Radio. Many thanks to Linda Bald, Samrat Chowdhury, Ryan David Kennedy, and Ivan Jenna for joining us. Our assistant producers this week are Charles Tringuinis and Samantha Wigand. Trevor Hook is our supervising producer, and Benjamin Brink is visual editor. Takiya Thomas is audio engineer. Kathy Kiley is executive editor. Travis McMillan is director. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>